Lord God, thank you that you are not like us, that you are perfectly holy when we read of your holiness in the Bible, it's often mentioned three times in a row that you are holy, holy, holy. We confess that we are often quite thick to recognize that. We see your people like the prophet Isaiah falling down before you when your holiness is revealed. God, we recognize that you are absolutely perfect and you are separate. Help us to be thankful for this because in your holiness you are just and you deal with the wrong in this world. God, as we face uh, difficulty in our personal lives, in our work, in the continuing of lockdown, I pray that you would encourage us and help us knowing that you, the holy God of the universe, are in control. And thank you that you have drawn near to us through Jesus Christ, who is the true image of you and who is perfectly holy. Give us confidence through Jesus. Help us just now, we pray in Christ's name, amen.
could rescue me from my failing who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father Jesus Christ, who's given us salvation through him. Amen. 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 Here's a song to celebrate Jesus Christ in our lives, in all aspects. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I hold my hope. For by my side, the Savior, he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, his power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend. night has been won and I shall overcome yet not I but through Christ in me
Thank you very much, musicians, for leading us in worship. It's such a joy to have live music in the church, even if we can't sing in the building just yet. Um, that was great. So we're going to turn to prayer now. Prayer is one of the great gifts that God has given us, the opportunity to speak directly to him. And that might sound a bit strange to some of you, um, that the God who created and sustains all life would want to hear from you or me, um, but that's exactly what he asked us to do throughout the Bible. There's no magic formula to follow. It's um, you can just have a simple, honest conversation between you and the God who loves you more than you will know. It's an opportunity to ask him for things that we are grateful for, to share with him the things we're worried about, and to ask for his help and to say sorry for things that we know we've done, said and thought that we wish we hadn't. We love to do this um, all together as a church, and this morning Keith is going to come and pray on our behalf. Hello. Let's um, join together in unity of prayer and join our hearts and our thoughts as we pray to God. Father God, we seek your blessing as we come to speak to you with our prayers. Help us to hear you as you speak with us. Help us in Hope City here to be a community of love in which any person can find acceptance, find a welcome. Father, save us from prejudice, insecure pride, or from narrowness of outlook, narrowness of spirit that can create barriers between the living Christ and those he came to save. Father, we pray for your church throughout the city and indeed throughout our nation, throughout the world. May the church worldwide remain true to your calling to make disciples and to teach them to live as you have taught us, lives of love and of service lives motivated and empowered by your Holy Spirit with us. Don't let us be hindered by different emphases on your gospel truth or by distinctively different patterns of liturgy. Father, may we feel and know the family bonds of being brothers and sisters together, all members of your own adopted family. We remember this morning before you that we have brothers and sisters 
in other countries who face constant danger, imprisonment, even death, just because they've come to know and love Jesus. May they know that we love them and that we care for them and we pray for them. Father, help us to support one another in your worldwide family and in the proclamation of your reconciling love to the whole human race with all our rich differences. Father, we lift before you especially the children of our world. I'm conscious that some 10,000 children will die today because of starvation and malnutrition. That happens every day. Help us to share your love for these children. Help us to do something about it. We give thanks for children who are brought up in love and in comfort. We give thanks for children who are brought up in the knowledge of your love for them, the knowledge of your worldwide family. May we defend and value the freedoms that we have for our own children. And we ask you to bless the children with us this morning as they enjoy time with their friends and learning about you. Indeed, bless all of us, Father, as we all enjoy meeting with friends and learning more about you. May the fragrance of your holy presence invade this meeting. May your spirit empower Ian as he speaks to us this morning and opens to us more of the truths from your gospel. And may all of us be blessed as we hear and learn together. Amen. Thank you, Keith. Uh, so alongside um, the things that we've just prayed for, we would love to be able to pray for some of the things that are going on in your lives um, and things that perhaps we might not know about at the moment whilst it's still a bit harder to uh, connect with people and spend time together. Um, so I know it can sometimes feel a little bit intimidating to share things with the whole church, but we are a family together, um, and sharing what's going on in our lives is a big part of that. So it would be great if you could take a moment just now to think about whether there's an encouragement that you have or a need that you would be willing to share with the church, um, something that we might not otherwise know about. Um, and if you head to slido.com on your browser and enter the code HOPECITY, uh, if you click to enter the prayer option, you can let us know there what's going on, um, and we will pray for those things in just a few minutes. Um, and also, if you're on the live stream, um, you can request private prayer if you would prefer that by pressing the request prayer button. So I think uh, we just have a couple of notices now. Um, some of our regular activities outside of our Sunday gatherings are taking a bit of a break for the summer. Um, our board games evenings will be continuing though. So if you fancy some chat and some games, um, you can join that on Zoom at 8.15 on Wednesdays. Uh, the link for that is on the Hope City Connect page. Um, and this evening, we have our final um, kind of formal small groups for the summer. Um, but we will continue to have something going on on Sunday evenings. Um, so if you're available and would like to join in, um, it will be still at 5 p.m. on Zoom. Um, and will just be a chance to discuss the morning's talk um, and pray together. Uh, there will be a host to lead it, but it will be a little bit more informal than normal. Um, Please come along if you would like to. You don't have to come every week. You don't need to sign up. Um, and even if you've never, ever been to any of our small groups before, um, you're very welcome to come along and just see a little bit about what it's like. So let's take a look at our prayer requests now. We should have. Lovely. Um, so 
The uh, prayer request should be on the screen this morning, so we're just going to take a minute or two, and um, if you just pick one or two and pray for them quietly now, uh, keep praying for them throughout the week. Um, We're really fortunate that our God is not a distant God, but is wants to be involved in our lives um, and wants us to come to him with the things that are going on in our lives. Um, so let's take, uh, the, uh, take that opportunity just now um, and I will close in a minute or so. Lord God, our Father, we lift these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. It's almost time for our talk, um, but first I would like to invite any kids that are in the building with us and registered for Hope City Kids or the creche today to head out through the doors over here with the rest of our team. Okay, so we're going to turn to our talk now. This year, we have been walking through the book of Acts in the New Testament. Um, It's a two-volume series um, written by Luke, um, and the first part of it is his gospel account of the life of Jesus, and then this second part, the book of Acts, uh, mainly focuses on how to help us live godly lives in this messy and confusing world Uh, between the time when Jesus returned to God's right hand after his resurrection and when he will return again, um, his second coming. Um, And this this period of time that we're in is often described as the final chapter, which is the title that we've given to our series. Um, And Ian is going to talk to us this morning. Before he does, let me encourage you to head to your... If you're watching live, to head to slido.com again. And I will just switch this over on there. Okay, we should have, uh, there should be a, a Q&A option there for you to pop in any questions you have. Um, studying the Bible often raises questions, and we want you to have the opportunity to um, have them answered. Um, so pop any questions you have into Slido as you listen to Ian's talk, and afterwards, Ian and I will do our best to respond to a couple of them. Um, If you're watching a recording and have questions, please pop them in the comments and somebody will get back to you. So over to Ian. Good morning, everybody. Double duty today. Weird instrumentation. The little one was a bass thing, if you can work that out, and the thing was called a melodica, if you're interested in that. Uh, There you go. Uh, Right. Now, how many of you grew up in church? How many of you spent time in church as a kid? Hands up if you were in church as a kid for any period of time. Now, what did you do? Shout out what you did during the talks when they were boring, if you had to stay in during the talks. In church wasn't as exciting back then. What did you do? Sleep. Sleep. Coloring. Coloring, yeah. Anything else? Thomas the Tank Engine. Thomas the Tank Engine. What did I like? Playing with the train? Yeah, I had Okay, had them on the trains, brought, the, brought, brought things, yeah, good. I'll tell you what I used to do. We weren't allowed to really do that, those kind of things. I used to leaf through the Bible looking for funny parts, like randomly, just sort of leaf through. Um, and I would write them down. When I found one, this, this had the advantage of looking like I was paying attention because I was leafing through the Bible. And if I found one, I would write it in the back of my Bible. Like, like this, is a, this is a funny verse. And I would look at those when I was a bit bored. I'd go to the back of my Bible and go, oh yeah, I'll look up this verse. And uh, you probably come across some of these, right? So um, this is what I used to do when I was, when I was asleep. I would, uh, this is, 
Instead of sleeping, I would do this. So I'd look up the funny ones. There's some funny ones in there. Here's one from Two Kings. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel, and as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. What did they say? Get out of here, you baldy. That's what they says in the Bible. They said, get out of here, baldy. He turned around, looked at them, called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 boys. Well, what's that all about? So I found that funny when I was a kid. I thought it was oh, that's hilarious. So I'd look that one up and think of that story. Uh, there's also the slightly confusing ones, the kind of non secretors here's, here's one from Proverbs 30 that I particularly found interesting. Conies are creatures of little power, yet they make their homes in the crags. Profound. Uh, then the grotesque. Uh, so here's the grotesque. And this is where we come to This is one of the verses that I wrote in the back of my Bible, and this is the verse that I'm now preaching on today, speaking to you about. It was this. Immediately, Herod did not give, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Again, I thought it was hilarious. And when I was a kid, (laughs) eaten by worms and died. Confusing. What's that? Why is that in the Bible? What's that all about? Well, we are in our book. Oh, that was the grotesque one. There we go. Immediately, that's what he said there. We're in Book of Acts. This is like a hundred page, two volume, well, it's a one volume thing, the bit of Acts, but it's about a hundred pages long. uh, And it's about the early church and about this handful of followers of Jesus who are given a message from God of good news for the world and a mission to spread that message, fan the flame out into the world uh, from where they are in Jerusalem, expanding out the way. And this was welcomed initially. But increasingly, there's opposition. If you've been with us since the start, you see it was all quite positive to begin with, lots of success, the message being well received. But we've had increasing opposition, both internally from things inside the church, problems and difficulties, and then externally, opposition uh, and things like that. And we, we're at a kind of low point in our story. Um, Herod Agrippa I, sort of notorious, wealthy, playboy, turned local ruler, you might be familiar with the Herods in the Bible. There's lots of them. It gets a bit confusing. Herod is like a family name, like Tudor or Windsor or Trump. It's like a dynasty. Uh, and this guy was a Herod, and he was called, his name was actually Agrippa I. There's also an Agrippa II to get things confusing. Uh, and this Agrippa I executed James, one of the key followers, uh, one of the key leaders in, in this uh, early church. And he does that, and it, he finds that it pleases the Jews. They're quite happy about this. Oh, good, kill off this, uh, kill off this James. And so, ever the crowd pleaser, he decides to kind of double down uh, and tries to catch Peter, who is the kind of key leader of the church. And he puts him in jail with probably the intention of a kind of show trial and probably a public execution. So the church is in peril at this point. James, key leader, dead. Peter, other key leader, in jail, probably going to be killed pretty soon. Herod, notorious oppressor of the church, on top, winning. Has God failed? Has the flame been snuffed out? Will the church wither and die? Will this message keep going or is that the end of things? It's looking pretty bleak. Uh, and last time, you, if you were with us, uh, Matt was taking us through the miraculous escape of Peter from prison. Escape's not really the right word. It's a prison break. Everyone's asleep. An angel appears and walks Peter through maximum security, through gen pop and out, uh, and the guards don't even wake up. Incredible stuff. The guards wake up in the morning. Herod's like, where is this important prisoner? They don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, And Herod is enraged, understandably, and kills the guards. And we're going to pick up from here. So Susan is going to come and read to us today's passage over there. Uh, And hopefully you're going to see that this passage isn't like a curiosity. It's not a funny thing to just write in the back of your Bible. It's a grisly death, and it's a warning. It's a warning, but it's also a reason to rejoice. And I'd like to think that by the end of the talk, you might be thinking that this verse is a great verse, a verse that instead of makes you feel a bit weird and and just a, a horrible warning, is something to lean into, something to see as an encouragement. How can somebody getting eaten by worms be an encouragement to the Christian life? Let's find out. Susan. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. After securing the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. 
they shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Thank you, Susan. Now, a couple of weeks ago, if you were here, John Douglas was taking us through what I have termed the teaching of the termites. So he was telling us that the church should be united, just like a termite colony. Very interesting how united a termite colony are. But this week, not the teaching of the termites, we have the warning of the worms, or the warning from the warning of the worms. Our, right, Herod is seething, okay? So Peter, his key prisoner, has, been, has, has, has left, vanished, whatever. And he's embarrassed, publicly embarrassed, this key prisoner gone. And he, so he, he slinks off in the huff to Caesarea. Now you see Jerusalem, where he was at this point, is the red circle, and then up a bit, the coastal town of Caesarea. It's like North Berwick, I don't know. Nice coastal town. Up the, up the coast a wee bit. Uh, and he goes there to attend a sort of miniature Olympic Games, um, which is a kind of festival that they had back then. Uh, but basically, he's happy to get out of Jerusalem, where all the kind of uh, embarrassment is. So off he goes to Caesarea. Now the towns of Tyre and Sidon, just up a bit there you can see with the orange circles, they know that he's due in town. Uh, and so they think this is a chance to sort out. There seems to be some kind of beef between Herod and Tyre and Sidon. Luke records it in the passage. We don't really know the details of it. But they think, right, Herod's close by. Let's meet him. Let's try and sort this out. Because Tyre and Sidon, the small coastal cities, depend on the larger central Judea region there in green to, to provide sort of economic stability. So this is their chance. Um, they secure the support of a guy called Blastus, who's Herod's right-hand man, verse 20 there. And it says securing support. Could mean they kind of bribed him. It's not really clear. Maybe that's a bit of a euphemism. Maybe they just convinced him of the merits of their argument. But in any case, they, they say to Blastus, we really need to talk to Herod. Maybe they give him some money. Blastus puts it on the king's agenda. Uh, and so here we are, king's agenda. And Herod goes big here. So Josephus, you may have heard of Josephus if you've been around church for a while, he is a first century Jewish historian. He's not in the Bible, he didn't write any of the Bible, but he records a lot of events that also occur in the Bible. And so you've got these kind of two things that you can look at. And he gives us a bit more detail about this story. This is in one of his books. And he records that this event happened on the second day of the festival. So day two, Herod uh, Herod goes big, and the, he, this is the appointed day. And Josephus tells us that this is daybreak, okay? So the sun is just about to rise, uh, and there's a raised platform onto which Herod walks, and he's robed in a robe made of silver thread. Josephus says it like this, clad in a robe made altogether of silver of quite wonderful weaving. I couldn't find a great picture of it, but it's probably something like that, right? Raised platform, um, daybreak, amazing silver robe, and this is pure theater. And so up he goes on this raised platform in his silver robe, standing there, the sun breaks over the horizon, light radiates out all over the place. He is really going for it. And the flatterers are so astounded. Josephus says, this is what they say, be gracious to us. Hitherto we have referenced you as a human being, but henceforth we confess you to be of more than mortal nature. Luke translates it for us helpfully. They shout, this is the voice of a God, not a man. They're so overcome by this appearance of Herod. Uh, and then we get to our verse. Verse 23, immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. Josephus tells us that actually the moment from there to his actual death was five days, and he suffered from terrible stomach pains. That's what Josephus says. Uh, Luke wants us to realize in recording this, that this is not like, it's not like an angel appeared and then there was a kind of heavenly lightning bolt or anything like that. It seems to people looking on that this is a natural death. Herod is there, starts complaining of uh, stomach pains. Five days later, he's dead. But what Luke wants us to see is this isn't a natural death. This is, this is God's judgment. This is by God's hand, carried out by God. The ultimate cause of Herod's death is God. What do we make of this eaten by worms bit then? What does that actually mean? Does it mean actually eaten by worms? Well, it might do, but it, it might also just mean, uh, it might be a euphemism. It's like a richly deserved death. Like we might say somebody fell down dead. We don't actually mean they literally fell down. They just died very suddenly. They might mean sitting down or lying down at the time. But the point is, it happened suddenly. That's how we would use that phrase. And maybe that's what eaten by worms means. It means someone really deserved it and they got what was coming to them. Maybe it means that. Um, 
But it could also mean like actual worms. You can get these kind of, I believe, these like cysts that can form, filled with worms, and after a number of days, they multiply and psh, they can burst out. It's pretty gross, sort of alien style. Um, but the point is, don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by the diagnosis. This isn't a medical diagnosis we're looking for here. This is a spiritual diagnosis. Worms in the Bible represent judgment. Whenever you see worms, it means death. It means judgment in the Bible. And this is definitely a case of God's judgment. God is pronouncing judgment upon Herod. And so perhaps it is just a euphemism, just saying this is God's judgment and then he died. But the point is, God is in charge. So what do we do with all this? Why should we care about this story, slightly bizarre tale? How could it possibly be encouraging to us? Well, first and foremost, it is a warning from the worms. Herod's death shows us that opposing God is futile. The Bible says elsewhere that God opposes the proud. So does this mean if you come up to me afterwards and compliment my talks, that was a very interesting talk, thank you very much, and I don't immediately give praise to God, I'm risking worm-infested death, or maybe you are? No, I don't think that is what it means. This event only happens once in the Bible. We don't see here lots of examples of worm infestation. This is a unique case, but what it's, what it's more about is Herod's posture. Not this particular episode. This is the apex of it, but his entire posture. His whole life is lived constantly in opposition to God. His entire life, thumbing his nose at God. Look at verse 21 again on your Bibles. Verse 21. He's got this fancy robe, this silver thing, all the pomp and ceremony. He's on this throne, which is what Luke records in verse 20, that he's sitting on the throne. The actual word there is judgment seat. So he set this thing up to say, I'm the judge, I'm the one in charge. Uh, and he's got this raised platform and then daybreak and the light bathing on him. He is trying to show he is a God. That's what he wants people to think. He's trying to say, I'm your God. Look, behold me at daybreak with light radiating on the judgment seat. I'm the one in charge. This is not unwelcome flattery from those around him. He's drawing this in. This is exactly what he wants to hear. And he laps it up. But the true judge says, no. No. It is not Herod's place to sit on the seat of judgment. He's a mere man pretending to be God. He thinks at this point, this is him at the top of his life. This is the best possible moment. Bathed in life, adoring, uh, bathed in light, adoring crowds, people saying he's a God. This is the pinnacle of his life, the happiest moment. And it's at that moment that God's judgment comes down and says no. Five days later, he's dead. Now, I'm just looking around. I'm not seeing any sparkly tops around. I thought maybe someone might be wearing a sparkly top. And I could, yeah. But anyway, no sparkly tops. But the, the, and a lot of us aren't really sitting in kind of high-handed judgment and proclaiming ourselves to be gods. And so you're probably sitting there with thinking, well, he probably did deserve to get eaten by worms, but I'm pretty sure I don't. You know, I'm not doing any of this kind of stuff here in 21st century Edinburgh. It's not so bad. I'm not as bad as Herod. But the truth is, we're not actually all that different from Herod. The Bible tells us that God created everything, that he made it all, and that he sustains it all, that he holds it all together, and that he is worthy of ultimate honor and praise, says this in a book called Colossians. For in him all things were created, things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This creator, sustainer God has the right to the place of honor in your life. And that's what it means to be a Christian. The Christian life is living as a loyal subject of a heavenly king. We Christians, those of us who are Christians here today, believe that God has the right to rule our lives, that he is the center of our lives. And he is the lens through which we view everything about our lives, our finances, our decisions, our actions, our relationships. Everything we do passes through this filter, this God filter. And when other things take the place of God, when we put other things above that, we dethrone God. We do a Herod. Whenever something else takes the place that God is rightly having in our lives, we dethrone him. We do a Herod. And Bible calls this sin. So think to yourself now, what is the thing that I can't live without? What can I do without? My bank balance? Is it my career? My academic success? The success of my children? My art? My music? My partner? My history? My my culture? 
My reputation. I think that last one's my one, my reputation. I, I feel like I've got a reputation for being a good guy. I'm a good guy, I think, most of the time. And I like that reputation. And I think losing that reputation, oh man, I'd be shipwrecked. I don't know what I would do if everybody thought I was a terrible guy, I got caught out for doing something outrageous. That'd be awful. Could I be a contented follower of God with a ruined reputation? I don't know. That's a challenging thought for me. And when I feel like that, it's proof that I'm doing a Herod, that I'm, I've, this reputation to, is more important to me than God. So what is it for you? What is the filter through which you pass your decisions and your actions? So when you think to yourself, here I'm faced with this situation, and you think, what is best for? How do you answer that question? What is best for my kids? What is best for my pension pot? What is best for my career? What is best for my family? What is best for my relaxation? What is best for my self-care? What's best for my happiness? My own fulfillment? If you don't answer that question, what is best for God, you're doing a Herod. That's a high bar. And that's a bar I don't think any of us reach. Because when we're honest, we don't live that way. We don't pass every decision through the filter thinking, what is best for God in this situation? We say we do, but we don't do it. Even those of us who call ourselves Christian. It's a bar that's just set too high. We can never fully live for God in that way. But the book of Acts is a story of good news. And it's part of the Bible, which is the story of good news. It's a story that looks forward to good news in the early parts of the Bible, that announces good news in the coming of Jesus, and then the implication, tells us the implications of that good news in the time after Jesus. The whole Bible, one story, God's good news. And that good news is that God is restoring the world through Jesus. His life, death, and resurrection. Real historical events that actually took place but had cosmic significance. Jesus' crucifixion that we think about at Easter wasn't defeat but victory. It was ushering in a new era of restoration and forgiveness. Because Jesus always lived a life fully devoted to God, always lived focused on his Father's glory first, never wavered, never put anything above that. He says, that bar that you can't reach, let me reach it for you. Let me do it for you. What you can't do yourself, let me do it for you. And it puts us right with God, heals the brokenness and restores us. And he calls us to be part of his new kingdom, and entry into that kingdom isn't by being worthy, isn't by uh, doing the right things, isn't by living a perfect, meeting the bar. That's not how you gain entry to that kingdom. It's bowing to the king. It's recognizing that we never meet the mark, but he welcomes us anyway because he met the mark for us. It's an invitation. It's a gift. And this is good news, right? It's good news because this is a kingdom that you can be a part of. And it's a kingdom where things are right where everything in the world that we live in at the moment is wrong. It's a kingdom where justice is not just never-ending guilt at past sins, but it's wrongs that are truly righted once and for all, where the weak and oppressed are set free, not just to go on to oppress others, where those in pain find a deep healing, not just to get broken and sick again, but well forever. It's the world for once as it should be. And we know deep down that's not the place we live, but that is the place we long for. But that isn't the whole story. If you're familiar with the Gospels and the accounts of Jesus' life, you'll know that he talks a lot about hell. And that's something we don't like to talk about. It's not a word we like to use. It's not a term, not something we like to talk about much. But Jesus isn't afraid to talk about it and tell it as it is. Listen to this poetic description that Jesus gives of what hell is like for those who oppose God and to the very end. It says in Mark 9, 48, hell is where the worms that eat them don't die and the fire is not quenched. There is something worse than Herod's death. As bad as it is to be eaten by worms, you die and the worms die eventually and it's over. But Jesus is saying in poetic language here, there is a place worse. There's a place where worms don't die, where fire doesn't go out, where suffering never ceases, where pain never stops. And Jesus says, those who refuse to be part of his kingdom 
will go to that opposite kingdom, the opposite of everything good in his kingdom, the anti-kingdom, the kingdom of darkness, eternal, terrible separation from God and everything good. So what do we do? We've got to listen to the warning of the worms. We've got to join the kingdom. Live under this new king. Live under his authority. Move everything into second place behind his honor. Make your decisions to please him. Above all, devote your life to living for him. It's called being a Christian. It's what being a Christian is. It's not just saying a prayer when you were a kid and then living how you like. It's living for God day after day after day. Now, I appreciate that is a hard message to stomach. At the moment, the way things are in the world, we, we hate authority. We think the path to wisdom is self-expression. Look for the hero inside yourself, and that will guide you forward. But Herod, what did he have inside himself? Worms. It's, it's a warning. Don't look inside. Don't look inside for that. Look up to God. Humble yourself before him. What Herod doesn't do, we must do. We must heed the warning of the worms. Okay, so far, so not encouraging, right? I was saying this is going to be a verse you're going to write in the back of the Bible. Seems like it's probably not feeling like that at the moment. Well, let's see if we can get somewhere. Look down at verse 24 with me. And this, this verse is the key to unlocking why this is an encouraging passage. But the word of God continued to spread and flourish. Luke wants us deliberately to draw a contrast between the worms and this, right? The worms in Herod's belly, spilling out in death and judgment. That's the gruesome image that Luke wants us to see in our minds. But then, verse 24, the word of God blossoming out in life and flourishing. A contrast between those two things. Two kingdoms, two directions. The worms bring death and judgment, but the word of God brings life and flourishing. Gruesome but memorable. And that, that's what God wants you to remember. The words of Herod swarm over in death, but the words of God swarm over in flourishing, in healing, in life, unstoppably swallowing up death and opposition. Remember back to the start of chapter 12. So if you go back a week or, uh, last week when we were looking at that. James is dead. Peter is in jail. Herod is winning, on top, triumphant, rampaging. Now, end of chapter 12, Peter is free. Herod is dead. And the word of God, flourishing and winning. God is in control. The powerful of the world look like they're winning, but they're not. God is in control. When it looked like everything was going to fizzle out, when it looked like the church had come to the end, when the message wasn't going to go anywhere, when it was all over, that is when Herod was eaten by worms. There's no one else there, right? No one else there for this. We didn't need brave Peter to stand up or some kind of wild miracle to happen. Luke is showing that God's goal, that this, this gospel spreading out, this good news spreading out, can't be stopped. And God can use the weakest, powerless, squishiest creature, the humble worm, to bring down the mightiest, strongest, most feared enemy of his people without anyone else being there. Like that. This is a good news story. It's a good news story because God hasn't lost control. He's right there over it all. Herod thinks he's winning the battles, but God always wins the war. So think about how it looks today. Our powerful people persecuting the church. Yeah, we're on the wrong side of culture and the media, I suppose. Are you under pressure not to speak up for Jesus? Yeah, don't feel like I can say a lot of things. Better be careful about what I say. Are you feeling like the church is a dying institution? Maybe not Hope City, but yeah, a lot of churches, yeah, probably feel that. That's exactly how these guys in Acts felt. It's exactly the situation they're in at the start of chapter 12. And when you feel like that now, remember this verse. Herod was eaten by worms. God's got it covered. There's nothing. No one can stand in his way. If you want to be on the right side of history, you don't need to be on the side where God is because he's the one who holds history in his hand. Herod was eaten by worms. Praise God. He's in control. Last week, 
we saw that God can do incredible miracles, can do an amazing thing, can do an astonishing rescue, get Peter out of prison. If you haven't, uh, where am I behind on my slides here? Yeah, if you haven't listened to Matt, I encourage you to go back and listen to Matt. You can scan that on the screen now. If you're watching at home, scan it on your phone. It'll take you to Matt's talk. Excellent talk about this passage. I um, encourage you to listen to that. Um, not now, listen to the rest of this talk, then do that later. Um, but we learned that it's okay for us to pray big prayers, even if we doubt, even if we're not sure, it's, it can happen. And I find myself in that situation now. Can God turn things around? Can society be turned around? Can, can the church win? I don't know. I'm not sure. I hope so. And, and this verse is telling me, yes, he can. He can do it. So let's pray for that. Let's pray that God can turn the world around. It seems impossible. It seems unlikely. But let's pray anyway. Why? Because Herod was eaten by worms. Praise God. He was eaten by worms. Are you facing opposition as you live, for life, live your life for Jesus in your workplace, at school? wherever you are, wherever you are. Do you feel that? Pray. Pray. God can intervene. When it seems impossible that, that, that you can spread any message of Jesus in the place that you're at because of the opposition that you're under, pray. He might do a Peter. might do some incredible thing. And if you need encouragement that he can do those things, do the impossible. What do we need to remember? Herod was eaten by worms. It's, it's good. But it's also good to remember that he might not. James, where's James? Still dead. James, killed at the start of chapter 12. It's highly likely the church prayed for James, just as they prayed for Peter. If you look back in the passage, that you, you hear the church praying for Peter. They were probably praying for James. God, deliver him. Don't let him be killed by Herod. But God didn't intervene to stop it. And of course, that raises the obvious question. Well, why? Why, why not James, but why Peter? Why didn't God save James? Why didn't God save my first wife who, who died of cancer? Why didn't God save my mom when, my, when her cancer came back just as we were having kids? Why, why, why? You've got your own whys, I'm sure. And James's friends are asking the same thing. Why? Why didn't God do this? And the truth is we just don't know. There are no comfortable answers here. But we do know that God's overall plan, the big plan, the good news spreading through the world is unstoppable. We know that God wins. And we know that there are bigger things to fear than our inevitable death here. Being a part of God's kingdom is what matters. As that's not just for this life, but forever. Death's going to come for us all at some point, no matter what. Time is going to be up. And you're either going to move into God's presence in his kingdom or forever separate yourself from him. And as painful as these losses that we have now of our friends and family, be encouraged. God is in control. These deaths are not the final answer, not the final end of things. And how do we know? Because Herod was eaten by worms. So whether God delivers you from opposition or not, whether he rescues you in this life or not, he will rescue you from the death that really matters, that separation from him. And if you're a part of Jesus' kingdom, you can view the troubles that you face here in this life as light and momentary. That's how the Bible describes all that we go through in this life. Because we can look forward to living in his eternal presence. How can we be sure of all that? Because Herod was eaten by worms. So as you think about this story, the next time you see a worm, it should serve as a caution should serve as a warning if we're not part of God's kingdom. But it should also serve as a comfort if we are. Herod was eaten by worms. Be careful. If you're not a part of God's kingdom, if you're not living under the lordship of Christ, heed the warning of the worms. But if you are, God is in control. He will win. He hasn't forgotten you. His plans will prosper. Be encouraged. Because Herod was eaten by worms. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, we know that so many things in our lives crowd you out and get in the way. We chase after career, power, money. We think these things will bring us happiness. When there's that happiness is only found as we live our lives for you, with you in our, your rightful place of honor. 
We pray that we would heed the warning of the worms, that we'd recognize our need to join your kingdom. But we thank you that you are in control, that these worms can serve as an encouragement to us. Father, I ask that you would help us to live for you. Help us put you first in our lives. And we ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Cat, John. Quick song. Thanks, Ian. And we still have to work here (laughs) doing a song now. So we're going to sing A Mighty Fortress just to celebrate that God is in control and he's all powerful. Um, The first line, our God is a consuming fire, a burning holy flame. And you might think, goodness, that is terrible news. But part of what a fire does is it purifies. And part of the, you know, what that responding to what Ian's saying is uh, God might put us through a fire, but it is a cleansing thing. And so when the chorus says, um, the bridge, sorry, we will keep our eyes on you, when that purifying fire happens, don't look down at your feet and say God doesn't care anymore. Keep your eyes on God in the midst of that difficulty.
This is our God, a secret refuge is your name, your kingdom is unshakable. Thank you, musicians, and thank you, Ian, uh, for sharing what you've learned from this passage in Acts. Um, we're going to have a look at the Slido questions now. I think we're probably just going to have a look at the top of the first one, just at one, because we're running a little bit late uh, today. So let's have a look at what's on the top of the list, and I think should be on the screen. Great. So what practical, practical steps do you take or could you take to push being seen as a good guy into second place. And I suppose more generally, anything that we find replacing God in our lives, how can we push them into second place? Yeah, it's a good challenge. Good, to, good that you asked me, what am I going to do about it? Yeah, because it's, <laughs> it's easy to stand up here and say, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, what am I going to do about it? I think the first thing is being aware of it. That that's, that's the thing. Do you know what that thing is in your life? So those questions that I put to you, what is best for when you're faced with any decision? Suppose you get offered a new job and it's going to take you away some other part of the country, think, what is best for? Do you think career? Do you think first? Or what's best for my wife? Or what's going to be best for my kids? If you think that first, whatever you jump to in those situations, that's your thing. And it should be, what is best for God? And so often it's not. So I, I think just awareness is the first thing. And knowing that is the first place to start. So I'd encourage you to think about that to begin with. Yeah, yeah. And I think asking, asking people to pray for you as well when you do know what that thing or if you're trying to work out what that thing is, share it with Christians you trust. Ask them to pray for you. If you're making a decision, ask them to pray for you in those situations. Right, that's, that's the point of the church. You've got folk here who can help and, and help you keep on track and help you put God first. It's difficult to do it when you're in it because your bank balance seems really important and you <laughs> want to put that first. But people outside can say, well, actually, look, if you thought about what effect that might have on your ability to come to church or be involved or you know, glorify God in your life, and, and they can help you think that through. So wise Christian counsel, great place to start. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay, I think we will have to leave the Q&A there. I've got one last thing I need, to, got, I need to give you yes, my final... You're coming to me. I was coming, I was coming to that. <laughs> Hold on one second, Ian, and then you can run away. Um, so there were some really, really good questions um, in, in the Slido. So if there's something you particularly want an answer to or help with, please get in touch. Um, you can email uh, questions at hopecityedinburgh.org or reach out to a member of the leadership um, because we would, we would love to uh, help you with those things. If you're on the live stream, you can jump into the Zoom coffee room and have a chat about things as well. So, before we close, Ian, can you remind us what the big idea of your talk was? I can, and the reason I'm particularly excited to do this today is because we have a visual aid. If you're here in the building, reach underneath your chair. You should find under there, blue tacked <laughs> to your chair, a little memento. On the, on the bottom of your chair, see if you can find it, hold it up, take the blue tack off, give me the blue tack at the end. We have worms for everybody. Got a little worm. Now, it's a bit of a gimmick, right? It's a gimmick. It's a gimmick, I grant you that. But it's a gimmick to help you remember. And what I want you to do is place this somewhere. You'll see it. Put it on your kitchen sink. Put it on your bedside table. Stick it to your bathroom mirror. And use it as a warning, but as a comfort. 
Herod was eaten by worms. Praise God. He's in control. That's what I want you to remember. So there you are. Take the worm. If you didn't get a worm or it's fallen off your seat, come and see me at the end. I've got plenty of worms. And uh, I'll take your blue tack back as well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, whether you've been with us on the live stream or you've been watching a recording. Um, you can join us this evening at 5 p.m. for small groups. Um, even though this is the final formal one of the term, um, even if you've never been before, please come if you would like to. It's a great way to get to know a smaller group of people um, and spend some time talking about the talk and how it applies to our lives. Um, if you are watching the live stream, we have a digital coffee room that you can join um, and catch up with people and have a bit of a chat. Um, so head to hopecityedinburgh.org slash connect for the link to that. Um, if you're watching a recording, I'm sorry that you can't do that, but you can still connect uh, with us through uh, email and Facebook and other things that we have going on. So if you just head to our connect page, everything you need to know will be there. So let's close our gathering with these words from the book of Jude in the Bible. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present, you to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you so much for joining, you, joining us.